All right, we are at the time, and we are understaffed, so we're going to sing to try to encourage people to come up. Uh, number 337, and this is, I think, common meter, so almost anything will go to this. So Dave, this can be an uh, adventure of your own choosing. 337, my father's way may twist and turn, my heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. For by and by the mists will lift and plain it all he'll, it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. 337. My father's way Thank you all for coming to the teaching meeting this afternoon. Before we open God's word, let's just take a moment to pray. Our Father, we are so thankful, first of all, for our Lord Jesus. We're thankful for his coming into this world. We're thankful for the life that he led here in perfection. We're thankful uh, that no one could point to his life and see any mistake. It was a life that was uh, was perfect in every way, every thought, every deed, every action, every word. We're thankful for the cross that he went to and that he bore our sins in his own body on the tree as we considered this morning. We pray as we open your word now that you would help us to speak, help us to listen, help us to be taught by your word. Give Doug and myself help, we ask, to uh, make uh, clear what has been laid on our hearts. We pray for the Sunday school as well and for all these young children that are learning verses and learning stories from the Bible. We pray that it might, uh, might prepare their hearts to receive the message. We pray as well for the gospel meeting tonight. Give help uh, to Matt and to Jeff as they prepare and as they speak tonight. And we ask that you would bless in all of these things. We thank you again for the Lord Jesus in his name. Amen. If you would open please uh, to the book of Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> now, if I said to you, I would like to do a character study on Joseph, your first thought would probably be the Old Testament Joseph. Your second thought would probably be Joseph of Arimathea. And maybe if you thought about it, you would eventually think of Joseph of, of Nazareth, the carpenter, the husband of Mary. I know this because I tried it on my wife and it took her three guesses as well to figure out what I was gonna, which Joseph I meant. Um, I can't really recall hearing too much ministry on Joseph. Um, I'm not, certainly not trying to be novel, uh, but I was reading um, 
in the early chapters of Matthew recently, and I was struck by what Joseph was called to go through. He perhaps doesn't get the press or the spotlight uh, that he deserves. Uh, in many ways, he kind of fades into the background. He, uh, he's almost hardly noticed in the story at all. Overshadowed, of course, by Mary, by the virgin birth, and you know, there's the cult following of her that has come from that. Uh, there's also the fact that, what do you call him? Uh, is he, he's the Lord's earthly father? Is he a stepfather, legal guardian? Uh, there's some you know, terminology. What, what do we actually call him? And you know, he's also, he's never mentioned beyond some initial chapters in the life of, of Christ's early life. Uh, other than some brief allusions. But, you know, as I was reading through Matthew, despite the very limited amount of verses that we have about him, the man that I see through the pages is one, I think, of great character, of great sacrifice. He's someone worth emulating as a father, uh, which speaks to me. Uh, But even if you're not a father or a parent, I think he still holds some lessons worth considering. So I want to start by looking at a number of verses to sort of paint a sketch of this man, And then I want to look at his character, his sacrifice, and hopefully, if there's time, his legacy. So let's look in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to do a few verses here and there. I debated reading them all in each book, but I think you lose kind of the chronology. So I'll tell you when to keep your finger and when to flip. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then if you skip down to verse 16, it's finishing off the list And it says, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So that's kind of introducing Joseph onto the page here in Christ's kingly genealogy. And then if you look at verse 18, Talking about the birth, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. Now keep your finger there because we will be back and then flip over to Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2 verses verse 21 through 23 says, at the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord As it was written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. Uh, And then down to verse 39, the same chapter. And when they had performed everything according to the word of the Lord, and then we have to pause. So Luke seems to have, for his purposes in the narrative, left out. Uh, a number of what we have in Matthew, but this is where it would chronologically fit. So just we'll read this and then we'll jump over back to Matthew. Return to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. So they fulfilled everything according to the law and eventually they returned to Nazareth, but there is this bit of a chronological gap. So then if you go back to Matthew, hopefully you still had your finger there. Chapter two, verse 13 When they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night, so it's the same night, and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. 
This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I will call my son. And then drop down to 19. But when Herod died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Sorry, back to Luke chapter 2. I'm doing this to keep the chronology, so I'm sorry for that. But uh, this is now uh, verse 41 of Luke chapter 2. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And then there's the story, obviously, when he goes up when they're 12, and uh, he is found in the temple. But if we skip down to verse uh, 46, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed, this is speaking of Jesus, at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Now I want to read one last section, Matthew chapter 13. This is a number of years later, of course, when he's begun his ministry. And uh, he's being rejected at Nazareth. You'll remember uh, that he um, was rejected in his hometown. Matthew chapter 13, verse 54 says, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And he said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Are not his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not his sisters with us? Where did this man get these things? And they took offense at him. Uh, And then he goes on to say, prophet is not without honor except in his own country. So I know that was a bit of reading. Um, But I wanted to paint a sketch, if you're unfamiliar or have forgotten some of these stages or these parts of Joseph's involvement in the life of Christ. So the first section, I would like to consider some of his character, this man Joseph. And the first thing I note is that he is just. The Bible calls him thus in Matthew chapter 1, says Joseph was a just man. So he was a man that was personally righteous. He was a man of high moral character. When Mary is found to be pregnant, he himself is aghast at what appears to be immorality on her part, and he resolves to divorce her. And so he is a man that the Bible describes as just. He is a man that, um, that we should emulate from that perspective. And we can ask ourselves, how is our personal holiness? Do we view sin as sinful, or do we tolerate it in our lives? Joseph was a man that, that did not in his own life and in the lives of those around him. But not only was he described as just, he was described as considerate, or I would call him considerate. His fiance, and bear with me, I know that some of the cultural practices and the age gaps, we're not really 100% sure of. So some of this is certainly using our language, but his fiance in our terms, you know, appears to him to have been immoral and he feels like he must divorce her. So think of, you know, the feelings of betrayal, the feelings of hurt, uh, of maybe shame, then he's wrestling in the night with these, with these feelings. And yet he wants to do it quietly um, so as not to embarrass her further or to shame her. He has no desire to lash out at Mary. He has no desire to get retribution. Uh, but then, of course, the angel appears to him and tells him, no, the conception is miraculous. Uh, and this is by the Holy Spirit. This is not through immorality. And so he's a man, I would say, though, that is marked by being considerate. Uh, He's a man that we could describe as honorable. He was concerned certainly for Mary's honor. I think that that bears out in his consideration, but also for the honor of Christ. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but he did not consummate the marriage with Mary until after Christ was born. And so he was already, I think, in his own way, making sure that there could be no taint 
at all, no innuendo, even though there obviously was in the way that Christ was conceived. And so he's a man that is concerned with honor, concerned with being an honorable person. Joseph is a man that I would describe as courageous. He was a man that was willing to face personal suspicion, uh, rumor, to have his own good name tarnished because of God's command. And the angel acknowledges this. The angel says to him, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. So there was obviously some element of trepidation on his part, and yet he's a man that obeyed the command, command of the angel. He took her as his wife. Here's a man who, the child is born, they, he's circumcised on the eighth day, the purific, time of purification is over, and maybe they were packing up to head back to, to Nazareth, to Galilee, and the angel appears to him the night and says, flee. And that night, he raised, he, he, rises up, takes the child, takes Mary, and flees to a foreign country where he doesn't know necessarily the language. Um, overnight, he becomes sort of the uh, Judea's most wanted, and he up and flees in the middle of the night, leaving everything behind um, to an unknown fate. So obviously, God had called him to do this. No doubt, you know, he could take some comfort in this. But I think that still required a great amount of personal courage and fortitude on his part. And then when the angel tells him to return, it's clearly to a still dangerous situation because Archelaus is reigning in his father's stead. And yet he still has the courage to obey the word of the Lord. So, you know, are we bold and courageous to defend the truth, to live out the truth, even at personal cost, to sometimes stand alone? Joseph was called to do uh, very actually courageous things, if you think about it. It's easy to read over, and he, they fled to Egypt. Quite a journey to a land he doesn't know, to a language he doesn't speak, to an uncertain future with a powerful king that now wants uh, the Lord Jesus dead. And yet he obeys. Um, sake of time, we'll, we'll move on. Another point I noticed about his character is he was industrious. He was known by his profession, the carpenter, or the carver, or the mason. There's kind of some debate as to what the term means. And he obviously passed his profession on to the Lord, who was also called the carpenter. Um, he was a man that was spiritual. He was a man who clearly values spiritual things and the things of God. So every command that the angel gives him from the Lord, he obeys. He doesn't question, he doesn't delay, he obeys, and he obeys immediately. He's told to take, he's told to go, he's told to name, he's told to return. And in each of these cases, he is obedient. We also read that he did for Jesus according to the law of Moses. That, uh, that the Lord was uh, circumcised, that they offered the sacrifices according to the law, that they went near, uh, yearly to the temple. I mean, this was a journey of some 90 miles on foot. And uh, so it's about a week's journey. And then... You're there for a week at the Passover or so, and then you're back. I mean, he's taking a month off to make a perilous 90-mile journey every year. So do you or I value the house of God? Do we value spiritual things the same way? Is meeting sometimes a challenge to come to? Um, you know, it's been a long day at work. It's such a long drive, 15 minutes. Um, you know, is it inconvenient to have to spend some evenings when it's 65 and sunny and the garden is calling to prepare for ESL or to prepare for speaking or to call someone who needs encouragement? Oh, but there's so many other things to do. This was a man who valued spiritual uh, service. He valued following the commands of the Lord, and he showed it forth in his life. Um, he's a man that was consistent. It says they went up to Jerusalem year after year. This was his custom. Uh, and, you know, we read in Luke uh, 4 and 16 that Jesus went into the synagogue each Sabbath as was his custom. And so, yes, in, in one respect, certainly Jesus was fully God, omniscient, omnipotent, not needing anyone to teach him. But in some sense as well, he humbled himself as a man and he learned and he grew and in one sense, I would say maybe this is something that was modeled from Joseph. Joseph was a man that was consistent, and that was shown out as well in the life of the Lord. Now, in the case of Joseph, it was not possible that his failings and sins would negatively influence or shape the Lord. We as fathers are not so lucky. Um, so our failings, our inconsistencies, our saying one thing and doing the other, our priorities are where we put them, 
can very much influence our children and their outcome. And so maybe a word of caution to us. But I can't help but think that some of, some of this was a pattern that the Lord observed as well from Joseph. But we might ask ourselves, what patterns and priorities are we having in our life? Now, the last thing, which kind of leads into the second section, is um, he was a man that was marked by being sacrificial. And this is what particularly stood out to me in my reading um, a few weeks ago. You know, the people in Scripture that we read about are often there because of the sacrifices that they are called to make. You know, I don't, I can't really think of anyone that we read about in Scripture that's just kind of going through normal life, doing normal, ordinary, unremarkable things and find their way onto the pages of Scripture. We read about them because at some point in their life, they are confronted with difficulty, with tragedy, with conflict, and they respond. And almost every time, these circumstances are not circumstances that they would have chosen. Some fail, some rise to the occasion. I think of Moses. You know, Moses, he's living this quiet life. He's uh, married to the daughter of one of the head honchos of Midian. He's got two sons. He's got a flock. He's doing well for himself. And all of a sudden, the Lord calls him and says, go back to Egypt, to that place you fled, to a people that are absolutely obstinate and are going to really just make you pull your hair out for the next 40 years. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to obey you. You're going to go through trial and hardship. And in the end, he doesn't see the promised land. Except from a hill looking across, right? So someone who, you know, from an earthly perspective, you would say went through a lot of difficulty and maybe we would say from a fleshly perspective, didn't really win. Um, but he obeyed God. And Joseph, I think, is somewhat like that. You know, he seems to be living a fairly normal, pleasant life. He's established. He's engaged to be married. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, his life is turned upside down. And what we read from there on is primarily about the sacrifices that he is asked to make. So the first sacrifice that jumped out at me was his reputation. And I already alluded to this, but, you know, when Mary is found to be with child, the Holy Spirit reveals to him that this is not through immorality. This is actually an immaculate conception. But do you think that the neighbors in the village understood that? No. And so the fact that he did not divorce her right away, in some ways, uh, to those looking on, might have been a bit of an admission on his part that the child was his. And so we can read in John chapter 8, verse 41, uh, this is a very, I would say, telling jibe that is given against the Lord. They respond, the, uh, the Jews he was arguing with say, we were not born of sexual immorality. Clearly, perhaps there is rumor, innuendo, stories going on. And so Joseph, he obeyed the voice of God, even though he would be wrongly tainted for a child that wasn't even his biologically. And so Joseph makes a great sacrifice here in his reputation, but he is willing to do so because the Lord has called him to this. Um, the next one I would say is probably the least important in the most short term, um, but that is just earthly pleasure. So Matthew 1, 25, he knew her not until she had borne a son. So let's be honest, how many people on their wedding night would sign up for another year of celibacy? Probably not many. Um, and God didn't ask him to do this. God did not ask him to refrain from um, any sexual activity with Mary, but he made this decision. Certainly there would always be innuendo, suggestion, but Joseph went above and beyond to guard the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. So yeah, it's a, a short-term sacrifice, but he made a sacrifice nonetheless, um, to, to, from his part, ensure that, or to, to, to demonstrate that. Um, another sacrifice he made, I'm kind of lumping these all together, family, friends, country, and security. And I'm thinking specifically of fleeing to Egypt in the middle of the night and then going back to Galilee. So he marries his fiancée, the child is not his, is born, and then all of a sudden the child, his mother, and himself uh, basically have a death sentence over their head, and they have Herod looking for them. And so he has no normal married life. He has no honeymoon period. He has no support of friends or family. I mean, how many people when they have their first child are grateful for their mother-in-laws or their mothers, right? Like none of that. They up in the middle of the night and off they go down to a country they don't know. Maybe he had to take Egyptian as a second language. He's down there in this country. He is, his people were supposed to leave. 
They were in slavery for 400 years, and now he goes back to Egypt at the command of the Lord. He has to maybe find a new way to make a living, potentially, all because he was called to be the earthly father of the Lord Jesus or to, to care for him. And yet we read in the scripture that he obeyed unquestioningly. And maybe the last thing from a sacrifice perspective was his career. Now I'm reading a bit between the pages here, but you know, we don't read of him necessarily being a carpenter before. It may have been the case. It's a perfectly fine profession. Some days I wish I was a carpenter, um, but it is what it is. Uh, we know that he had been living in Galilee before the Lord's, the Lord's birth, but it seems maybe, and maybe I'm reading between this, but maybe he wasn't necessarily intending to return there until Herod sought their lives. I mean, this is a man who was of the royal line, yet he finds himself doing very unremarkable work in a very unremarkable place in the backwater of even a backwater province in the Roman Empire. This man is directly descended from David, and yet he's doing very humble things in a very out-of-the-way location. If he had plans for prosperity and advancement, he gave those up. Why? To protect his family, to protect the Lord. So are we willing, and I kind of spoke to me, are we willing to make sacrifices to be involved in the assembly? Are we willing to make sacrifices to be involved in our children's lives, to be there, to be present, not just to be the one that puts the eggs in the freezer and, you know, the, the bread on the table? Are we there to invest in our children's lives? He made a sacrifice. Now, obviously, there was still some fear of what might happen if you know, Archelaus or whoever came after them. But still, he chose to live in a spot that maybe, you know, wasn't even really his home location. Obviously, he had been there before, but, you know, he, they just had a child. Why would you not be back in Bethlehem where your family is from? But he makes the sacrifice because he is called to do so. Um, so in the last few minutes, I want to talk, that was a bit about his character and about some of the sacrifices that jumped out at me. Lastly, I want to talk for a few minutes about his legacy. <clears throat> So Joseph appears and disappears rather rapidly from the pages of Scripture. Um, we, don't, we never have a single word that Joseph says recorded in the Bible. We have plenty, words, plenty of words that, uh, plenty words that Mary says, but there's not a single sentence or word ever recorded that Joseph says. Uh, we do know that he and Mary go on to have at least six other children together. There's four boys, James, Joseph Jr., Simon, and Jude and at least two girls, because it refers to his sisters, so at least two. But we have no other details. We don't know um, anything from Scripture about what happened to him. Of course, there's all sorts of traditions and thoughts of what may have happened, uh, none of which is backed up by Scripture, so we'll leave those. We won't even mention those. But um, it does seem clear that by the time Jesus reaches adulthood and begins his ministry, that Joseph is already dead. We read uh, there's one case where Mary and his siblings come to him and they wish to speak with him. No mention of Joseph. Obviously, by the time of the cross, the Lord commends Mary to Matthew. Not to, well, not even to his half-brothers, but to Matthew. Joseph is nowhere around. So Mary is clearly at this point a widow. So we don't really know much about him. We pretty much read at the beginning every verse that we have that references Joseph. Um, but he was a man that God used to fulfill prophecies. So a number of times we read, to fulfill what was spoken of the prophet. He's the man that conducted them to Bethlehem so that Jesus might be born in Bethlehem of Judea. He named the Lord Jesus according to the command of the angel. He took them to Egypt and cared for them there so that it could be fulfilled by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. He took them back to Nazareth so that Jesus might be called according to the prophet, a Nazarene. So the Lord used this humble, unassuming man to fulfill a number of very, very key prophecies in the life of the Lord. He was the man as well that God used to provide for and to, in some senses, train up the Lord in an earthly sense. Two of his biological sons, James and Jude, wrote books of the Bible. Now, obviously, they were unbelievers during the time of, of Christ's life, um, and were subsequently saved by the Holy Spirit. But still, in some sense, Joseph gave them the upbringing and prepared them and gave them the spiritual foundation. And then they were able to then receive the word of the Lord. So anyway, I know that was kind of a, a 
fast run through Joseph's life. But when I look at Joseph, I really see a father to emulate. A man who was marked by great character traits. He was a man that was uh, spiritually minded. He was a man that was just. He was a man that was honorable. He was a man that did all these things. He was a man who uh, instilled spiritual habits and values in his children. He's a man that obeyed the word of the Lord that was revealed to him. He was a man that lived in a self-sacrificing, unassuming way, and yet was used mighty by the Lord. So, uh, again, I know that was quick, but maybe we can all uh, appreciate a little bit about the life of Joseph and in our own lives, um, strive to be a little bit more like him, a man that was simply called the husband of Mary to whom Jesus was born, the carpenter in Nazareth, but a man who was mused mightily of God and who uh, can really be an example to each one of us. May God bless his word. Thank you, Luke. That was, uh, that was great. I don't know if I've ever heard ministry on Joseph in that fashion. Um, I'm past the father bit, but we'll try the grandfather bit now. Let's see if that, if that can do something there. I'd like to read today in uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. No surprise to a few people who are, are studying this right now. I'm just going to read a few verses, starting in verse 3, 2 Timothy 1, starting in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Obviously, this letter is written from Paul to Timothy, and that would have been a great encouragement to know that Paul was praying for him constantly night and day. Verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you also, a sincere faith that dwells in Timothy. Verse 6, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. And this next few verses is really what I'm going to be speaking on today. Verse 7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And we'll read verses 7 and 8 one more time. This will be my primarily text. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. I think that goes well with Luke's message. It certainly was Joseph. He uh, lived a life, obviously, that he was not ashamed of the testimony of God and obeyed. And so this section here, um, I've been reading in the Psalms. I had, a, uh, I had a friend at work, and we go back and forth now and again. He's a Christian man, and he told me, hey, I'm reading the Psalms. I'm trying to do five or ten of them a day and get through it and go through it a number of times. I thought, I haven't read the Psalms in a long time in that fashion. And so I said, well, I'm not going to do ten at a time. I'm just going to do one, and I'm going to try to get the theme and a key verse out of it and work through it that way. And the Lord through that in this section really brought this this all together. So we're going to start really with the spirit of fear. Um, what does this spirit of fear really mean? And the word fear here is, it's, as I understand, it's only used once. Uh, the root of it is used more times, but it's only once here, and it really means to be timid. And you go, well, that's no surprise, that's Timothy, timid Timothy, right? We all have Peg Timothy as this timid guy. Uh, yet he did some amazing things, obviously. But then the other word that's used to describe this word is one that really struck out at me, and it's cowardice. Now, I might be okay if someone called me timid, but if someone were to call me a coward, that might get a little bit of a different response, because I would not think of myself that way. But 
Here, Paul is writing this to Timothy, and these are the words that he uses. The spirit of fear. The spirit of timidity. The spirit of, of cowardice. And an example of this might be in Joshua 5 and 1, and I'll just read this. It says, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites which were on the side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites which were on the sea, by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until we passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them any more because of the children of Israel. That's the thought. They had no fight left. They were shaking in their boots. They were going to be cowards. And they were afraid. So that's really kind of the sense of this word that is, is here. And I just wanted to kind of think about that for a second. Because he's, he's writing this to Timothy, and therefore he's writing it to me. And maybe he's writing it to you as well. That's why it's in the Word of God. Well, you think about that for a second. You're like... God has not given us a spirit of fear in this way. Of, of course not. That's a ridiculous thing. Why would the Almighty God, all-powerful one, the creator of all things, he would never give the spirit of cowardice, the spirit of timidity, would he? That, that's a ridiculous statement. It's almost laughable to even consider that. And so why would Paul preface his statement that way? Why would he even put that in? He could have just skipped that whole portion. He didn't need to say, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. He could have just said, God has given us the spirit of. There has to be a reason he wrote that in there. Because we do, I should I say for myself, we do at times have a spirit that is timid or that is cowardly. And he knows that Timothy has this. And so he's pointing it out so Timothy will take note that when that comes up, when that feeling, that sense comes up into your heart, it is not from the Lord. That sense, that feeling that I think I shouldn't say anything, I think I should walk away, I think I should, I think I should, that has not come from the Lord. He does not give that kind of spirit. And we can remind our hearts that no, we are to stand as we hear in the Scriptures. We are to stand for him. And so I think Paul's making a point by contrast here. He knows that Timothy is timid. Maybe perhaps he just doesn't have that natural ability. Some of us just our character is a little more, I don't know, should I go that way? Ooh, that looks a little dark alley. I'm not going down it. You know, whatever it might be, right? And so we can have that timidity. We can be afraid. Also, it can, might just not be our character. It may be the devil working in our lives, wanting us to fear, wanting us to be afraid, wanting us not to step forward. That can happen as well, right? And so just a, re, a reminder here that that spirit, that thought, that twinge of what I should maybe not do, God does not give that spirit. Remind our hearts of that. God does not give us that spirit. So Paul says, okay, now that you've got that, Timothy, that, that timidity that you have at times, and maybe it's not with witnessing, maybe it's not with, well, it might be with the Christians. Timothy, as we read through 1 Timothy, he had a lot to deal with as a young man. And, and Paul is trying to encourage him and say, even amongst the Christians, I don't know if I really should bring that up. The Lord has laid this on my, I don't know if I really should, I'll just kind of let that lie for now. And maybe that spirit of timidity is not just when it comes to the world outside, but also could come to us, the world within, us as Christians, brothers and sisters together. We're like, I'm really not the guy to, to correct that. I'll, I'll leave that to somebody else. I'm not really the person for that. Really? Has the Lord laid it upon your heart? Has the Lord given you something to do? Well, He doesn't give you the spirit to, spirit to not do it then. He gives you what's coming up next. This is what Paul is giving to Timothy at the beginning of the last letter that he's ever going to write to his son in the faith. He says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power. The spirit of love and the spirit of self-control. 
Let's look at these three things for a minute. The spirit of power. Obviously, when you think of the spirit of power, you think of the Holy Spirit. And we've been given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us. And I, to be honest, I forget that. That we have the power of the Spirit within us. The very Spirit of God within us. Do we understand that? The word is really kind of where we get our word dynamo. And it makes me think of the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> Quite honest. I'm thinking, just keeps going. It just keeps going. It never stops. It never gives up. It is always there. It is always on. And that's the Spirit that we have within us. The Spirit of God Himself, the Holy Spirit, sealed within us. That is the power that we have been given, that power to go on. There is no need to fear, obviously. And yet we do. We confess that. But we can stop that, right? We have the ability to choose how to handle these things. We're not talking about, in that case, obviously the energy on Bunny is physical energy. He just keeps going, 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 going. And sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we break down. Physically and mentally, but spiritually we don't need to. Spiritually we have that power. And as he's telling him, you have so much going on, Timothy. You are a young man. You are here, and I've asked you to do many things. And you're getting hit from every side. You have this power. This word is used as the power when miracles take place. Okay, when miracles take place, this is the power that we're talking about. The word is used speaking of God himself. In Matthew 26 and 64, the Lord Jesus says, you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Same word, the right hand of power, the very power of God, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Also with the woman who touched the hem of his garment. When we read that in different versions, say virtue went out from him. Right, he, he knew that. He was touched and virtue went out. But the word there is power. It's the same power. It's the power of Christ to heal. It's the power of Christ to do miracles. It's the power of God. The very power of God Himself. And so, Timothy, no spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. A spirit of power. And then what? Now a spirit of love is the next thing he mentions. A spirit of love. And this love is the agape love that we talk about so much. I love the way Vine defines this. Love can be known only from the actions it prompts, he says. God's love is seen in the gift of his Son. But obviously this is not the love of complacency or affection. That is, it was not drawn out by any excellency in its objects. It was an exercise of the divine will and deliberate choice made without assignable cause, save that which lies in the nature of God himself. That's big. You know, try to read that whole thing. I've, I've kind of distilled that down for myself in this, that love always seeks what is best in the object loved, and despite the cost to self. That's how I've always turned it. That's what I taught my Sunday school kids. That's what I taught my children. That's the love that we're talking about here. The love, the very love of God. So we have the spirit of power, and we have the spirit of this kind of love. And you can't have this kind of love without the power of God. And so, do we do things that are consistent with this spirit of love? He's telling Timothy, we're talking about agape love. We're talking about love that seeks the benefit of others in spite of what it's going to do to you. That's certainly not a spirit of fear or cowardice. That's a spirit of courage and power to do what is right. Like, Joseph, I mean, that must have been something. I, I was thinking as you were speaking, uh, Luke, that this ties right in. Joseph was a man who lived this way, quietly, on the pages of Scripture, but that's how he lived. So, we have the spirit of power, we have the spirit of love, and now we have the spirit of self-control or discipline that's mentioned here. And it's, uh, it's like saving the mind... It's uh, to safe or to save, and you kind of go through all of these little definitions. It's an admonishing or calling to soundness of mind or to self-control or to discipline. Sound, making good decisions. It's kind of how it came to me. Making the right decision. A sound mind, a calm spirit, 
a taking in of what is going on and using the power of the Spirit, the power of that love to do what is right, to do what is righteous, to do what is godly. That's what he's telling Timothy to do. No spirit of fear, no turning and running, no being a coward. That may be your natural makeup, Timothy. It may be my natural makeup, but that's not the makeup of the spirit that's within us. And that's who we have to lay hold of. So it's a soundness of mind. It's not a weakness of mind. You know, it's not a, a scattered, frantic mind. It's like, what am I going to do next? Where am I going to go? What's, this is too much for me. I can't handle this. No, it's a calmness. It's a, what does God's Word say? How can the Spirit use me in this? How can I display the love of God in whatever situation is going on? That's what he's talking about. That's the kind of sound mind. It's a mind that's directed by God through His Word. And again, Joseph, he got the Word of God. What did he do? He said, okay, I'm going to obey it. Do we actually do that? Do we know the Word of God and do it? That's the challenge. That's the challenge he's given to Timothy. It's the challenge he's given to us here. So we have those three. I think, well, why just those three? I mean, he could have gone with the whole fruits of the Spirit. He could have talked about faithfulness. He could have talked about mercy, but grace. He could have talked about all these different things. Why did he put more? Why did he only put these three things in here? And I kind of rolled that around in my head, and maybe you have a better answer than I do or what I've come up with. But to me, it comes down to 1 Corinthians 13 and 13. These three remain, faith, hope, love, but the greatest of these is love. The love of God is the greatest thing that we have ever experienced. Because in that, He gave His Son to die for our sins, that we might have our sins put away, that we might come into a relationship with Him, we might understand the power of of the spirit that he has to live within us and to live for him. But love is that centerpiece. And that's the way that it, it kind of came to me. I really enjoyed that. With We, we need the this power of the Holy Spirit to display the, the love of God, that true love of God, and then that spirit of a sound mind, of, of self-control, then is what disperses who God is outside of me. So those are the three things. And tied up in that is obviously mercy, grace, faithfulness, all of these other things that are the fruit of the Spirit. But it starts with the Holy Spirit with love and then how it extends out of me. And that's with a sound mind that takes these truths and makes them real. So I think that love is the key. In 1 John 4, 19, we read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. There is no fear in love. You'd say, what is the, the opposite of, of cowardice? What is the opposite of timidity? And most people say, well, courage. Courage, right? Courage. No, maybe the scripture would say, love. Because displaying this kind of love takes courage. And so that's how it came across to me. But he, he writes all this, and, and it's not just to say, okay, um, you don't have the spirit of fear. You don't, don't be timid. Don't be a coward, Timothy. You have this power of the Spirit. You have this love of the Spirit. And you have this sound mind that you can use to display who God is. And could have just stopped there, right? What was the second verse that we read? That is really why Paul is doing this in my mind. Therefore, right? He states this. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control or discipline. Therefore, why did he give this to us? Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Therefore, do not be ashamed. Well, that ashamed and cowardice and timidity kind of go together, don't they? Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Timothy was prone, as we could see here, to being timid, to having some difficulties. And he's encouraging Timothy here. Again, this is the last <clears throat> letter he's going to write. Timothy, his son in the faith, the one who is really picking up 
the baton, the torch to carry on. And he wants to make sure that he, that he is not one who will be ashamed. And I was like, I was thinking about this for a minute. It's like, okay, so we can be timid and we can be cowardly, and what would that mean? We don't. I don't think we ever want. And I have a verse here we'll talk about in a minute, but we don't want to ever be considered that way when the Lord returns. That we were timid or we were cowardly for Him. We would. We would certainly be ashamed of that at His coming. We have a verse I'll read on that as well. But what I liked is I, my mind then went back to the beginning, first part that we read. And he noted to Timothy that he was sure of something that Timothy did have. He was sure of something that Timothy did have that then would make all of this possible. He was certain that Timothy had unfeigned faith like that of his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. He had placed his faith in Christ. And so this was available to him. This is something that he could move forward with. And that sincere faith is that it's something without hypocrisy, some, something that's sincere and real. And it's always funny when I read through this section, because do you all know what my mom's name is? Eunice. And I would say my mom's a faithful woman. And I would pray that I'd be faithful as well. And her sister's name's Lois. Not her mother, but anyway, so there's a lot of connection to this verse, and when I read it, it, it jumps out at me. But I want to have that kind of faith that he's talking about that Timothy has. Timothy has this faith. He has this faith. But he also has this character about him that he was born with, that he needs to fight against. And so this is, this is, the, this is really where it comes down to reality. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ and who He is. We read in 1 Peter 4 and 16, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So we don't want to be ashamed. We want God to be glorified in our lives. We would all say that. We would all agree that that's what we want. Are we making decisions that are consistent with that? We think of the, some examples of this. Obviously, the, the greatest example is the Lord Jesus himself. Obviously, the Lord Jesus was never cowardly or timid or any of those things. He was given the Spirit without measure. We know this is true. And I was thinking about the Lord Jesus in two instances. I was thinking of him in the garden when everybody forsook him. And he knew that he was going to be standing ultimately in a position where even God the Father was going to forsake him. But he was steadfast. He was going to complete the will of his Father, knowing all that was going to take place. There was no cowardice. There was no timidity. There was the power, and he did it out of love, and he did it obviously with a sound mind, although many thought that he was crazy. He made the right decision. And I was thinking about him before Pilate. And in John 19 and 11, we read, you know, they're talking away, and it says, Jesus answered him, You would have no authority, you would have no power over me at all, unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. The recognition that all that was taking place was in the power of the Most High. Even though it was a situation, obviously, we wouldn't want to be standing before somebody that was going to condemn us to death. For something that we didn't do we'd say it's not fair it's not right it shouldn't happen what happened to the lord and certainly we can find ourselves in situations maybe not exactly like that but do we realize that all of this that is taking place is still under the power of the most high the same power that's within us to endure it and to bring glory to god in that situation and then in 1 Timothy 6 and 13, we read this, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made that good confession, referring back to that again. So the scripture notes back to the Lord Jesus Christ being faithful to the Lord in that position, faithful to God his Father in that position. So we have the example of the Lord. Then we have the example of Paul and Paul and Silas. Paul writes this very famous verse we're all very aware of. 
Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And my mind runs to, and there's so many instances you could run to with Paul, but Paul and Silas, right? They're preaching the gospel. They get arrested. They get beaten. They get thrown into prison. I certainly would be a little downcast at that point. I would probably be saying, why did this happen to me? And I don't think I would be singing... I'd like to think I would be, but I probably wouldn't be. I'd probably be thinking about my own wounds and licking my wounds and this horrible bit. But they were a testimony. They were singing praises to God in such a way that ultimately we know that the jailer was saved and the family as well because of their testimony. And so they were able to exercise sound judgment, a clear mind, even in the presence of horrible pain and suffering. And it's hard to make good decisions under pressure if you're not settled in your mind at what is right and the direction that you need to go. That's when frantic things happen. I think of, you know, when crazy things happen at work and there's, there's certain people you see that they have experience many times, but they also have this ability to cut through what's going on and to understand really what the next steps need to be. And if that management guy isn't there, then everybody else is like, I don't know what we're supposed to do. I don't know where we're going to go. What's going to happen? And there's all this frantic behavior. But if there's that one person who goes, no, this is the right path, this is the direction, and this is why. And that's just like a worldly example, but spiritually, we should be in that same situation. When something comes up, we say, this is what the Word of God says. This is the direction that He would have me to go. I know why, and I know I can move in that fashion. And then we have, coming back to my little comment on the Psalms, we have David. David, we read David, right? I mean, his life was just full of all kinds of highs and lows and and just crazy things, but yet... As we heard this morning, David was a man after God's own heart. And yet he had failings. And we read read where he's crying out to God. And he's crying out to God. But he always says, you hear me. You heard me. He knows God hears. He knows the one in whom he's believed. We take from the New Testament Scriptures. And I have this one verse, Psalm 34, verses 4 and 5, two verses. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears, which I'm talking about today. We do not have the fear of timidity or cowardice. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look at him are radiant. Those who seek the Lord are radiant. And the radiance isn't in us. It's like Moses. It's because of God in our life. That's where the radiance comes from. And their faces shall never be ashamed. We will not bring shame upon the one who died for us. So, I talked a lot longer than I thought. I thought it was going to be a short message. Um, I've used up all the time. The key points. God does not give us a spirit of fear. That is either the devil, that's something in the world, it's our own failings, personally, our own character traits that need to be adjusted. And they need to be combated with the power that is actually given to us. Love, sound mind, the Holy Spirit, He is our Lord, let others know we serve the very Creator of our souls. Let us not be ashamed of Him or His people. Has there ever been an instance where you wanted to maybe distance yourself from somebody who said they were a Christian? I have just a little, before I was saved, I'll grant that. Before I was saved, I remember there was a baptism at our house, in our pond, in the front yard. And all of these people were standing out there singing, and there were people getting dunked in. I mean, I wasn't that old. Maybe I was, I couldn't have been that old because I climbed a tree like Nicodemus to get away from it. Um, but anyway, I remember sitting at the top of the tree, wondering if any of my friends were watching what was going on. And there the Christians were. They were not ashamed. They were very happy that someone had been saved and wanted to be baptized. And they were singing. And there was this boy up in a tree who was ashamed of what was going on. I hope that's not in my life nowadays in any instance. But we can be 
ashamed of the Lord, we can be ashamed of the Lord's people. And we are not to be. That's what Paul is saying here. We are to suffer with them. And we do that by applying the true power that is given to us, the Holy Spirit, having that love that is indescribable, the love that has saved us, and making sound decisions. A sound mind, a calm mind, a clear mind. And we can have that with the Scriptures. When we're not in the Scriptures, when we don't have the Word of God, we're flustered. At least that happens in my life. But if I'm in the Word and something comes up, even in this instance, I happen to be reading these sections and the Lord just brings this to me and it calms me. It makes me realize that I have the Spirit within me. It makes me realize that I can stand for Him. And so I pray that that would be the case for all of us here. And with that, let's just uh, close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Your Word. Think of our brother Luke bringing before us today Joseph, and what a life he, he led. We really don't get to see much of it, but you think of him watching the very Son of God grow in his home and knowing that he would have influence as fathers and mothers do on their children. It is, a, it is something that really can jump into our hearts when we think of having raised children or raising children or even thinking about it. We just pray for help for each one who is raising children, that they would do it in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Certainly that is what Joseph demonstrated. And we thank you for your word as well. We think of Paul writing this letter to Timothy, someone who could be timid in nature, someone who may want to turn away from the hard thing, perhaps. And he reminded Timothy that he did not have the spirit of fear given to him by God. God could not do that. We know that you do not give that. And when we find that in our lives, may we be reminded that we have been given the power of the Spirit. We've been given the Spirit of love, the love that drew your heart to send your Son to die for our sins, certainly undrawn by anything within us. And also the Spirit of a sound mind, a disciplined mind, a mind that is calm, a mind that is at peace a mind that ultimately we trust will glorify you. We pray for these things, for the gospel tonight. We pray for souls. We thank you for the children who have learned more of the word of God today. We pray for them. We ask for your help in the rest of the day. In the Lord's name, amen.